Hello and welcome to a special episode of Palace Confidential. This week I am exploring the extraordinary relationship between the late Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh with author, historian and friend of Palace Confidential, Dr Tessa Dunlop. Tessa has written Elizabeth and Philip, a story of young love, marriage and monarchy, which is out this week and which you can buy by clicking the link below. Tessa, hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, tell me first, why this couple? Why did you want to explore them in a book? I think it was triggered to an extent by the reaction to Philip's death when on social media there was a bit of a backlash. Quite a famous public historian, you know, said, oh, don't keep on asking me to make comments on, you know, the Duke of Edinburgh's death. I write history for the many, not the few. And I write a lot of history with Philip and Elizabeth's generation, with the World War II uh, generation, predominantly women. And I thought, no, hang on a minute. Elizabeth and Philip were their pinups. They, yeah. they, they were for the many, not the few. Actually, I felt that that narrative needed to be flipped. Uh, this was the last generation that really believed in monarchy and in marriage. And they stayed married, they no did. matter what. They really did. And also, they believed in, in the institution of monarchy. Like, there was a magic to it. Th th you know, there was something bigger than it just being an institution of state, something that was integral to the British constitution. And Philip and Elizabeth obviously were the embodiment of that monarchy. So I wanted to kind of explore how those two things, marriage and monarchy, went together. Now, remind me, how many years were they married? 73. It's extraordinary. I I mean, and, and it worked. Why, yeah. why did it work? It, it worked. And yet there were some extraordinary contradictions within the marriage. That was the other reason I wanted to look at it. In, in so many respects, it was like a textbook World War II romance. I can find you several other nonagenarians, a couple still alive today who actually feature in the book, who had schoolgirl crushes on their sweetheart who was serving overseas, who developed relationships with him um, in letter form mainly, who hardly really met each other, but had these enduring crushes mm. that resulted in early marriages. You yeah. know, post-war, they crashed down the aisle. And, and of course, were led by Philip and Elizabeth. I think it's the, it was a record year in 1947 for, for peacetime marriages. They both gained hugely from each other in very different ways. Mm. They were greater than the sum of their parts. Yeah. And first of all, if we look at Elizabeth, and there were some great diaries that have now been published that I was able to access, she really did have a convincing and enduring crush on Prince Philip of Greece from the age of 13, well, he 14. he was very handsome when he was yeah. young. Yeah. He was knockout. Mm. He was absolutely blow away beautiful actually and I remember pulled out a draw in the, uh, uh, the army museum and accidentally there he was because he wasn't even in the army under cellophane and it was a sort of foot long poster and I was like having oh a bit of hot flush. <laughs> <laughs> that was another incentive for writing yeah. the book. <laughs> Finn, look at some nice pictures. And also yeah. one of my Bletcher girls who I wrote about Bletcher Park earlier, um, she died last year but, but after Philip died um, I went to see her and I said, tell me more about the Duke of Edinburgh, because I always remember she said, I knew his girlfriend. Because he had a bit of a reputation, did our well, Philip. Well, we'll come to that. But, and, yeah. but even before, so Elizabeth is stuck in Windsor with this crush, and she's cutting out pictures or press cuttings, whatever he's mentioned, and putting them in a scrapbook. I mean, you know, it's a proper schoolgirl crush. It's deeply sweet. Meanwhile, Philip, you know, he does actually maintain contact with Elizabeth from quite early on in the war. But he's also a young man at sea. Come on, give the guy a break. He's lovely. He's special. He knows he's special. He's a yeah. prince of Greece. And he dates several very beautiful women. And one of them was this Osler Benning, who was one of the debutants at Bletchley Park. It doesn't end up coming to anything. She, she gets engaged to someone else, actually. But um, I spoke to Pamela and she said he, she was really very beautiful right like this. i have it on good authority she was a knockout wow yeah so there was i i was interested in looking at his you know life he, he clearly was very attractive to these flighty gorgeous women and elizabeth represented something very different for a man born in exile understood the humiliation of exile had no real money was nomadic the indignity of that mm. really no wonder he was a bit brusque and elizabeth she was steadfast she was sweet and she had a knockout inheritance you know it was all it was a wacko combination it was deeply attractive and i think there was something so steady about her even as a young girl you see that her governess noted it her friend um uh, althea who writes this diary noted her sort of you know her 
imperturbability yeah. that, that kind of rock and he needed that. I mean his childhood was all over the shop. What do you make of, what were you able to learn rather about the difference between their public relationship and the private? Yeah, I mean that is something that is uh, often explored or alluded to. I noticed that the new series of The Crown that's coming out in, within the week um, leans heavily into this friendship he had, latter day yes. friendship with Penny Romsey or Natchville, um, posh people always have a lot of names. Yes. Yeah, it's very difficult writing yeah, well, about I'm them. I'm glad we're all yes. here to decipher it all for me, a common Aussie. But, yeah. um, so, uh, and I think this was, this friendship clearly was um, one that the Queen signed off. We know that. They had a friendship. She came to the late Duke's funeral where the guest list was very restricted. Yeah. Um, and it is, it was a part of, of a pattern, you know, Philip and his friendships or his funny friends, as his equerry, Mike Parker's wife, referred to them. She always said that Elizabeth referred to Philip's friends as his funny friends. Um, something that had been there really from early on. There were these rumours, even when um, she wasn't queen, when Princess Elizabeth was pregnant with Charles, there were rumours that he had this inappropriate liaison or a night out with Pat Kirkwood, who was this famous kind of actress, you know, who had legs up to her armpits. And of course, it was hotly denied. There was no concrete evidence. He was given a dressing down by the king. It didn't hit the press until much later, 1957. But this... Um these rumours, these whispers of mm. infidelity have been a real thread at times through the Crown. What do you make of, I understand they'll be leaning in reasonably heavily on his relationship with Penny Natchbull? Yeah, and to that I would say that we have, and it's a sort of post-World War II hangover, an obsession with the most important ingredient for a successful marriage to be monogamy. Mm. And actually, I'm not saying we've no evidence whether he was yes, monogamous or not. What are we not. learning now, Tessa? Okay. Yeah. But, so I'm just going <laughs> to quickly put that to one side. Yeah. But um, yeah. the inference is he wasn't sexually faithful. That's, that's what people infer in all their... Now, whether he was or not, the Queen and him clearly had an enduring and loving marriage. And a partnership. And a partnership yeah. that she uh, lent on and he lent. They both depended on each other. And actually, if you look at a lot of the models of marriage from the early 20th century, especially the aristocratic ones, monogamy didn't have the high currency that it does in today's world or indeed uh, post-war when it was all about the companionate marriage. And I think the Queen understood Philip's need for freedom. She was asking a lot of an alpha male to step in, you know, behind her, to support her, to relinquish his name, mm. to relinquish his house. They're in Clarence House. Churchill huffed and puffed and insisted he got the hell out. And by the way, why couldn't it have been House of Windsor of Edinburgh? You know, all the old bottocks surrounding that young queen were male, past their prime, and did not want a really handsome prince anywhere near. He wasn't even a prince. He'd foregone one. his title and a foreign one. Yeah. So I think the Queen absolutely understood the, the tightrope that Philip was asked to walk and she cut him some slack. Mm. Now, whatever that means about his behaviour as a woman, I don't know. And, and he didn't want us to know. And the Queen didn't want us to know and, and seemingly was at peace with whatever happened. Mm. So it does, I kind of feel irked for them that people go round and round in a circle on this. But what do you think then about um, the series of The Crown where there was some sort of like inference about the Queen and, and Lord Porchester? Right, so I went in, indeed, there was sort of balance. That was, I yeah. almost felt that that was like Peter Morgan, is it, who directs the, yes. the, the, the crime yeah. feeling. The model of marriage after the war is companionate marriage, where couples expect sexual gratification and exclusivity. Pre-war, and of course they married after the war, pre-war, they were marriages were much more independent. So couples would have different hobbies. And Philip and Elizabeth, I think, were much more an independent marriage model. You know, we know famously they didn't always share a bedroom. Uh, we know also they had very different hobbies. I mean, famously, she never went to Cow's Week. She, quote, unquote, avoided it like the plague. Yeah. You know, she left him to his funny friends. And likewise, she had her own hobbies. Yeah, Philip could ride, he loved his carriages, he did polo, but he didn't speak the equine language that Porchy did. Mm. Interestingly, that friendship, so I track it right from the beginning of Elizabeth's young life, really to the scandal that blows up in, in 57 and, and the kind of whole hoo-ha around, um, you know, that solo tour, Commonwealth tour he did oh, yes. where Mike Parker, you know, uh, all implodes his equerry, has this messy divorce. What's interesting is Porchy was a childhood friend of the Queen's. On VE Day night, 
She goes dancing in London, famously. It's one of the few times she's given a slightly longer leash. She has a high old time, and I met the daughter, the stepdaughter of a man who was the doppelganger of Philip, who had a proper one-on-one -on -one dance with Elizabeth. He remembered it till the wow. end of his life. And his family only believed him when that film, A Big Night Out, came out in 2015. And when you look yeah. at pictures of him, you almost can't tell the difference between him and Philip. In so fact, she's got a type. <laughs> so she's got a type. And on that, that yeah. night that she was out on VE Day night, she was also with Porchy. Mm. He was, you know, he's a little bit older than her. He was sent to sort of look after her. So are you telling me this is a woman who's going to fancy her oldest childhood friend, who's going to end up in a sexual liaison with him two decades later? I, I just don't think it stacks up. I don't think it, it, it I don't think it, it, with all that we know about the Queen, I consider that to be highly unlikely. I think they did have a deep, companionship, a deep friendship that Philip wasn't part of. Mm. And Philip was cool with that. You mm. know, I, that, that was the model of their marriage, you know, the independent marriage. And of course, the, the crown sort of almost sort of, it's a bit, you know, what, what are they implying? Oh, they're skirting around it. Just goddamn well say what you think. You know, it's almost kind yeah. of um, pretty sordid and cheap the way in some respects they go about it. But it, I am in no doubt that they both considered their marriage highly successful, loving and supporting. And it worked, it worked for them and it worked for us. And what, how did the Queen's death affect your approach to the book? Did it change your perspective on anything? Well, it's interesting that, because when I was writing some of these bits about Philip, you know, all the Pat Kirkwood stuff that kicked off in 48 and then everything coming to a head in, in 57. I spoke to some very old people, 99-year-olds, who remember this all breaking in the press, mm. were absolutely following it. It was like these guys, Philip and Elizabeth, were the pin-ups for a new moral tenor that Britain had heavily invested in. And suddenly, were they being sold something that didn't exist? Was this a sham? And it really mattered in the 50s. And I wanted to interrogate that thoroughly, but I was worried when the Queen was clearly a very frail old woman about doing that right. when she was alive. I find it interesting now that everyone thinks we should be more sensitive now in the wake of her death. You know, she's had her mourning period. And I think that I feel more comfortable in some ways about the book coming out because both her and Philip are now dead. Obviously, I've not published anything that hasn't been said before, or, or indeed, I have done some original research in the newspaper archives, but these papers were printed, yeah. you know, in, in 1950s, in, in, in the 1940s. And I'm a huge supporter of monarchy. You know, I have a very different approach from our dear Richard. <laughs> I'm, I'm a monarchy light. I want it to work for us. I, I need it to, to keep changing. But I also recognise that if you have the human heartbeat at the centre of an institution, you have to cut them huge slack. And I love Philip and Elizabeth for managing to keep us guessing. They didn't let the light in. The truth is, we don't know. But tell us what you think about Philip, because I certainly remember um, when he passed away, mm. it was almost like a bit of a canonisation. The media was full yeah. of praise yeah. and, and, you know, what, what, a, what a life well lived and well served for the country. But when he was alive, he yeah. had several critics. Um, you know, it wasn't quite so warm when he first appeared on the scene, was it? No, um, we were deeply sceptical about a foreign prince. There are parallels. Well, this is an interesting narrative. Yeah. That, that, that we that, seem doomed to repeat. Yeah. There are clear parallels and some massive differences, of course, between him, say, and the, and the Meghan narrative, yeah. where we are instinctively and immediately suspicious of a beautiful, they were both unquestionably beautiful, yeah. beautiful, relatively poor, compared to the royal family, incomer, marrying our crown jewels. We, our hackles rise. This is a new thing, a 20th century thing, two world wars, the idea of, you know, dynastic marriages overseas, you know, that was rubbished. And I was shocked, I've got to say, by the coverage in the press towards Philip, post-war, before they get married, so between 45 and 47, there was a large, a hefty minority, a worrying minority of people who did not want Elizabeth to marry Philip because he was a foreigner. And they, there was the whiff of the fortune hunter to him. But I found more disturbing, really, was that a lot of the courtiers and those around the, the young princess, and even the Queen Mother, to, or who would become the Queen Mother, she was the Queen then, were very cynical. They didn't like 
the Teutonic blood coursing through Philip's veins. I mean, he was a Greek prince. They didn't like Greece. It was perfidious. It was always in a mess. It flirted with the fascists. So that was rubbish. He didn't actually have any Greek blood, but he had lots of Germanic blood. Yeah. And of course, we didn't like that. I mean, Britain right. was so kind of thin-lipped that we couldn't even see fit to let Philip invite his sisters to the wedding in 1947 because they were married to Germans. And is that um, the influence of you, the, the infamous all-pervading courtiers? I think it was a bit of both. I think it was an insecurity also coming from the House of Windsor. I mean, they weren't far, too far removed from their ha ha Hanoverian yeah. bloodstock. You know, they'd renamed themselves in 17. The last thing they needed was another dollop of German blood. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> but, but interestingly, I don't know if you can run the picture, but the Daily Mirror, on the day of Philip and Elizabeth's wedding, run a picture of Philip in Greek costume as a child, just to remind everyone, hey man, it's a Greek marrying the heir to the throne. Hello? Yeah. I mean, give them crazy. a break. Yeah. Do you know the other thing that I was quite struck by was a lot of royal biographers say, oh, you know, they didn't have a problem with the press in those days, not compared to today. They so did. Right. They so did. Elizabeth was born in a goldfish bowl. Mm. It really impinged on her ability to date, to grow up normally. Well, it's interesting, you know, going back to that, that story of the Queen's VE day night, mm. you can't imagine any of the, the modern princes and princesses not being able to have a night out. I know, yeah. but, but to be honest, when they do have nights out, that's when they often come asunder. Yeah. You know, if you think sort of undignified and appropriate fancy dress costumes, we won't name yeah. him. Yeah, Las Vegas swimming pools. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's of course, everyone's got their mobile phones now. Yeah. But, uh, and, what's, and the other thing that's interesting, and I never really thought about because we think of Philip as the exhibitionist, but the queen was much more relaxed around the cameras than Philip was because she'd been born with it. Philip had been born knowing he was special, a prince I'll have you know, you yeah. know, pretty boy getting the girls, but he wasn't used to the press intrusion and he never really wore it like a second skin. Yeah. But do you know what was interesting? And again, this came up in my newspaper research. When Philip and Elizabeth, as the Edinburgh's, go on a big tour, first they go to Paris, that's their first overseas tour, then they go to Canada and America before the Queen ascends the throne. Then they have their big Commonwealth tour to Australia, yeah. you know, it's a massive success, New Zealand, etc. It's Philip that outshines his queen, especially in the American press. They can't get enough of him. They, they write, literally, he has stolen the show, not his shy princess. Wow. And they say she doesn't smile enough. And it, they loved him. Britain could never quite love him because he'd do bought think, into it. Do you think even ultimately? Oh, ultimately, there was a deep fondness, wasn't yeah. there? There was a deep, but, but by that stage, you know, he'd done his time and he was the essential scaffolding to monarchy. But in those early years, it's interesting, we weren't entirely a fay with letting Philip have the limelight, but I think Elizabeth was. I think she loved those overseas tours. There's a whole thing about Britannia in the crown and about the affection they had for that vessel. And I think one of the reasons is she had Philip all to herself. Yeah. There's no polo matches, there's no supper clubs. She's his on those tours and also, he is shining because he was a great player in the Commonwealth. Yeah. He was an everyman. He was born, mm, yeah, okay, in Greece, but actually he was the baby of nowhere, really. He was, he was an everyman. He was an international figure, yeah. and he really played to that international audience. Let's, let's talk about them as um, mother and father. How do you think their marriage has influenced their children's relationship and then their children's relationships? Do you know, I reread that book that Dimbleby wrote, the semi-authorised one on the Prince of Wales, came out in the 90s when they was pushing back against, you know, the whole Diana machine. Yes. And there is coded criticism of his parents in that, as, as we know, and, you know, Harry later picked up on it, you know, the pain, parenting pain. Yeah, not, not, not quite so coded. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Ch Charles clearly felt that he didn't see enough of his parents. It wasn't quite cosy and hands-on enough. And certainly there was a sea change in thinking in the 50s that we should all be a bit more loving and, and babies were expected to hang around their mother's coattails or apron strings. And the Queen didn't buy that. And because Philip was sidelined in terms of his role within the machinery of state, he was given a lot of the decision-making. And sometimes I think he made the wrong decisions. Mm. Gordonston clearly wasn't the right fit for Charles. But I think... The hardest thing that Charles was gifted, or the hardest legacy, was this thumpingly successful, old-fashioned model of marriage yeah. that Elizabeth and Philip, you know, had. In a way, that big, puffy, nuptial 
event that all of us remember emblazoned on our minds from 1981 yeah. was the direct successor of the wedding in 1947. It was almost like time hadn't changed. But of course we know that social revolution, massive change had taken place. But do you think that what happened with Charles and Diana and then subsequently Andrew and Sarah is something that Philip and Elizabeth just could not understand? I think there was a big gulf in understanding, but having said that, the Queen early on was the closest witness to where divorce can land you and what happens when divorce overlaps with the royal family because of her sister Margaret. You remember she got divorced in 1978, much earlier than that she wanted to marry the divorcee Townsend. Mm. So the Queen was well versed in the fallout from an unhappy marriage and how that's going to impact on monarchy. Philip himself, you know, his own parents didn't stay married. They didn't divorce, but they were separated. They lived in separate countries. Yeah. So they were very affait with marriages that didn't work. I think there was a degree to which Philip and Elizabeth, as their generation did, thought, you know, come on, suck it up, yeah. get on with it. You know, monarchy is bigger than marriage in some respects. And that it's, it, it's a contract that's not necessarily yeah. all about love and romance. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and marriage is bigger than monogamy. Yeah. You know, and a lot of their generation would hold fast to that idea. I think latterly they came to understand the decisions of their children much better. I think we'll soften with age. And I think Philip and Elizabeth were lucky. They, they loved each other. They loved each other differently. Elizabeth loved Philip, properly crushed on him. And she won her crush. And Philip loved Elizabeth. She changed his life. I love the detail. I'd not heard that before about her cutting out pictures oh, of him, like she, I might have done as a 13-year-old. Yeah. Yeah. She, she, <laughs> yeah. she absolutely, unquestionably fancied that man rotten. And when she sends letters home from her honeymoon in Balmoral, she's like over the moon. And Philip's pretty happy too. He's got his feet up. He's gone shooting in the snow. He's snuggled up to a corgi. And boy, has he got a platform for life. Yeah. And does he use it? Yeah, he does. And that's the other thing. We all go, oh, poor Philip. He had to retire from the Navy early. Oh, stop with the poor Philip. Could you name me one admiral? Could you name me yeah. one admiral who ever had the platforms the Duke of Edinburgh had? Let, let's talk about Charles and Camilla. How do you think they will be as a double, double act? What What... Do you think about their relationship, particularly compared to obviously his first marriage? I think they'll be fine domestically because we've got fond. We, the thing is, Philip and Elizabeth were a product of their generation. Their marriage was a product of their generation, uh, the way they lived their life, even though they had this exceptional monarchy umbrella. Charles is the product of his generation. 50% mm. of them got divorced. He was one of them. Ditto Camilla. You know, he drinks a bit of wine, he has a bit of a laugh, you know. It, it kind of got fond of him. He had his eccentric hobbies that, hey, have come good. Camilla, we see her as this kind of, almost the unrequited love that, that was never allowed to be. Uh, and the conservative press have got on side for Camilla. They bat her corner. Where they've got a tougher act, a harder one, is overseas, in his foreign realms and in the Commonwealth, where the Diana narrative is much more prominent mm. and they haven't been sold Camilla and got used to Camilla in the same way that we have. And they love the crown, which is seems to be, you know, well, but, well into the Diana agenda. It yeah. is into the Diana agenda, yeah. but they also, Diana's a little bit silly in the crown. They're all fallible in the crown. The marriage fails, but don't we all fail in our marriages a bit? I think... We can't say the crown is fiction and then whip the crown for not supporting our monarchy. The crown's doing a very good job of keeping up numbers visiting yeah. Windsor Castle yeah. and Buck Pal. You know, I went to the coronation, there's a spectacular coronation exhibition in Windsor Castle in the summer. It was heaving. And yeah. I don't think there was one Brit in there. <laughs> I mean it. I mean, the tills are ringing for the royal family. When I read all, you know, when I tracked right back to Elizabeth's young years, looking at the archive, looking at her life, the gig you want is to be queen, to be monarch, because it's very clear where you're going. I think it's much harder for other royals to find their feet, to find their role, and it's becoming increasingly hard when is there's that, other is, temptations. Is that your plug for the book Spare as well as, no. rather magnanimously no. as well as your book? No, God damn it. <laughs> if you buy Spare and not my book, I tell you, 
unlike Harry, I'm a historian. <laughs> Harry may have lived the history. <laughs> I've read it. No recollections but, vary in Tessa's book. But, but yeah. I think, um, you know, and, and also that generation. If you believe in the gig and you're sitting in the front seat and you strap in your seatbelt and you've got the co-pilot that you wanted and he's all right, a bit tasty, then you're going to go for it and you will live a happy and fulfilled life. But I think she, she knew she, she'd got the great gig. And I think she, for the most part, there were bits of her life that she enjoyed and relished. And the one thing I thought was missing from uh, that period of mourning when, when she died was the celebration almost. I, I wanted us to say this was a full life, lived to the very end that's physically possible and lived well and lived for us, lived in service. And for the most part, with the man that she properly fancied. Mm, till, the, till the end. Till the end, I believe. Tessa, yeah. thank you so much for a fascinating insight. And thank you at home for watching. A reminder that Elizabeth and Philip, A Story of Young Love, Marriage and Monarchy by Dr. Tessa Dunlop is out this week and available to buy on the link below. We will see you again for another episode of Palace Confidential on Thursday. Bye bye for now.